Hi y'all, Darla here with Growing Tropical. And in today's video, I am going to be actually introducing you to my front yard landscape. I don't believe I've ever done the video. No, I've done a couple of videos so far, but I haven't really done a video where I actually um, introduce you to my landscape and the things that I actually grow um, here in the area where I live is in South Florida, um, a zone 10. I would like to talk a little bit about um, the things that I love to grow, some of the staple things that are in my garden, some of the things that give me nothing but grief, but I grow them anyway because they're so beautiful, um, things that um, I battle as far as insects are concerned. Um, so just a lot of little, um, a little bit of information just about my, um, the things that I like to grow and um, in, the, in the area that we're actually located. Again, like I said, I'm in my front yard and it's probably about 7, 7 30 in the evening and it's still probably about 88 89 degrees with uh, maybe humidity around say 65 70 percent so it is high not an uncommon thing for us here in South Florida but um, it allows us to grow a lot of things living this deep in the south that um, a lot of people can't grow um, in the landscape actually um, in the colder climates um, I know that um, I, I jump on YouTube quite a bit because I learn from everybody and some of the videos that I've been actually um, watching one particular is the plant uh, plant party tropical plant party I think it is I just love his channel it is absolutely a scream I believe he's like in Wisconsin or something like that I'm not sure if that's correct but I want to see he's there a five a zone five or a zone six and I watch him grow tropicals that's actually what um, intrigued me about his channel was the fact that he grew such beautiful tropicals and I believe he grows the majority of them like in um, containers which I think is absolutely fascinating because it just goes to show that you can grow almost anything in anywhere no matter what your climate is as long as you're growing them in the proper um, environment so putting them in a container and bringing them in and overwintering um, I believe he even had if I'm not mistaken a queen palm in the landscape but anyway um, that's kind of what this video is about today uh, just a little bit of a brief introduction of some of the things that I grow here in my landscape year-round um, that I generally don't have to overwinter because we don't usually get too much um, too much freeze here at all to be honest with you but anyway um, let's go ahead and start with um, the front planter I'm going to flip the camera around and kind of just go through some of the things that I actually have in the landscape and um, just kind of give you a little bit of a brief um, idea of what they are if hopefully I can remember uh, that's one of the biggest things I tend to forget some of the things that I have I mean I know what they are but it's like I you know I draw a blank with with what what I actually have because there is so much so anyway bear with me and we're gonna kind of go and walk around a little bit and just kind of look at the landscape so turning the camera around um, I'm gonna go ahead and start here we have um, actually these are thyralis I am actually not real sure um, if these are in the best place anymore when I put these guys in um, a couple of years ago now I put these guys in they did not get the shade that they get now they're under a canopy of three very large queen trees that have just put on an enormous amount of growth because like I said we live in a much warmer I got a spider I think growing or crawling on me here but um, with the warmer climate you know comes a lot of growth so anyway when I put these thyrellus in these um, or in the planter here I put actually two thyrellus bushes in front of each of the queen palms and they grow these beautiful as a matter of fact let me see if I can show you yes right here they put on the most beautiful yellow um, flowers and it's quite a show when the whole thing is just covered in them and um, my concern is that they're not getting maybe enough sun I'm not real sure I'm gonna go ahead and just let them go a little bit um, I think the, re the remainder of the summer just to kind of see once if they will put on flowering the second thing with them is I'm trying to keep them hedged down a little bit lower than I have in the past because I have so many beautiful things in this front bed right here that I really, I, I want, even though they will get a little bit higher, like um, this particular arbicolor, it will get higher, the crotons, they'll get higher. I'd like to keep the thyrellus, you know, like right around maybe the two, three foot area, I'd like to keep it down lower. And with that, um, the the blooms that are on there the yellow blooms that are on the thyrellus they actually bloom on you know it's new growth they don't it's not old wood that they, they come out on it's all new growth and so with that new growth will shoot out like these yellow spikes 
And so consequently, I'm not real sure. It just seems like every time I go and I try to hedge them down, I'm cutting off that new growth. Hence, there goes the blooms. So it's kind of been a little bit of a trial and error, you know, with, with this particular shrub this year for me, like I said. And, you know, in the years past as when I've had them in, I've let them grow higher. And they just, like I said, they put on just an absolute show. And they were beautiful. But you couldn't see as well into the flower bed. So, again, you know, as a gardener, you know, we, we kind of come... You you know, up against these types of things where you know we're always kind of you know changing things and the looks and and um, you know with with this particular one I don't know if I can keep him as low as I'd like to and put on the beautiful yellow um, show that they normally do so anyway those are thyralis they're very warm um, tropical plants they grow I believe they are considered a uh, zoned I believe it's um, 9 through 11 um, they do not like the chill at all. As a matter of fact, even when we get a little cooler here in in our in our area, Zone 10, they don't put on um, near the blooms that they normally do for me. As a matter of fact, sometimes they'll lose. This past year, I want to say they lost all of their their blooms, or not lost them, but they they didn't. Once I trimmed them, they didn't regain the blooms like they would normally when this temperature stay a little bit warmer. Um, the other thing is they do not like wind. So if you put these guys in, you have to put them in an area where they don't get um, a wind because literally you can see they're very very um, flimsy, and that's really the way they look all the time. Even when they're trimmed and they're nice and bushy, they just are very very flimsy, and so consequently. Um, a little bit of a wind can can definitely just you know break them off and tear them up a little bit so you definitely want to make sure that um, you keep them in an area where you can um, protect it from the wind the one beautiful thing that I have noticed about this is I have not knock on wood I have not had any bug problems with this particular shrub at all um, like I said they've been in for several several years now and I I, th I think bugs fly over honestly and they are they look at my property and they all land here I got scale I got aphid I've got skeletonizers you name it I pretty much got it but honestly these thyrellas I have not had any bug problems so that's a good thing about these which is another reason why I, I would really like to be able to keep them where they are because um, I love the fact that I don't have to do anything with them and they still put on a pretty good show and hopefully by keeping them a little bit lower that I'm not going to ruin that. So anyway, moving on from the thyrellus, um, we've got um, the copper plants. That's what I call them. I think there's probably a technical term for these guys, but I call them copper plants. When I was a young girl, my mother used to grow them in the landscape all the time. They were quite pretty and the only thing that I really remember from her growing these was um, that they did develop like a fungus. They got like, um, I, I believe it was not sooty mold. What is the other one? Um, a powdery mildew. They get a pow like a powdery mildew. And so um, if I think if I can stay in front of that and keep them treated with a fungicide, I think I, I will probably be good. But these are absolutely spectacular. The coloring on them is absolutely beautiful. They have like this pinky color along with this bronze I'm trying to see the back of the leaf. Yeah, look at that beautiful pink color that's on the back of that leaf. They're just so pretty. And then they, you know, with the mottled green that's in there, just really, really spectacular. Now you've got a little bit more of a burgundy or like a deep, uh, deep burgundy here, which is really, really, really pretty. But um, so hopefully if I can keep those treated with a the fungicide, they'll continue to grow nice um, and stay beautiful for me. I have noticed too that these guys, they're another warm tropical plant a zone. I don't even know if they're zoned for nine, maybe nine, nine B um, up to 11. These guys um, are definitely warm, warm weather guys here. They love the warm weather. It's like I said, the only thing that I've noticed that, I, you know, that might have the problem, like I said, with my mothers, as a matter of fact, you know what, as we're talking, look at here, look at what I'm seeing here. Here's a little bit of bug damage. Not entirely sure what that is, if that is maybe a skeletonizer I doesn't look like so it could be just like a some kind of a little worm but see constantly constantly I swear to you bugs love my yard so I will be treating that guy um, I, I just looked out here the other day and I swear to you there was no damage out here at all so very very quickly in this warm environment you've got to be constantly 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 looking at, at your plants so anyway that is an oyster plant they are absolutely beautiful love the warm weather as a general rule like i said i was thinking i was going to be dealing more with just like a fungus you know uh, like a powdery mildew but apparently they're very um 
they're susceptible to whatever it is that's on there as well. So anyway, moving on from there, um, we've got the Arbor Cola. These are absolutely beautiful. I love them. They're a, um, actually they're very versatile. These are um, variegated. You can also get the ones that are just like solid green. Um, I have two, actually, I have two Arbor, actually they're not called Arbor Color, they're called Chef Alera. I have two Chef Alera that are, the, the growth habits of them, and I'm going to probably get this wrong, you've got Arbor Cola, which is a, more of a shrub, then you've got the Chef Alera, which is more of a tree form. I believe, I believe that's correct. The Chef Alera, I don't know if they come in variegated, I've only seen them I think like in green, the Arbor Cola do come in solid green or they can you can get them in this beautiful variegation right here i love it because i love the creamy yellow um like the yellowy white with the green it just really gives the garden a pop and when you stand back and you look at the different colors that are in there it just i've got one over in this area too and they just absolutely pop you can see oh where's he at there he is they just absolutely pop and they're absolutely gorgeous. But um, anyways, as I was saying, I've got two Chefaleras that are actually growing in pots and I've got them on my uh, cabana out in the backyard. But out here, these guys are just so beautiful. They do get, um, I believe, thrips. I've had problems with the thrips with them. They also, um, the aphids will get a hold of them. I've had scale on them. Um, I've had slugs eat them. You name it. You name it, I, I've pretty, like I said, I pretty much had it. But they're easily treatable. If you keep on with, just with anything, if you keep, if you know what you have and you keep in front of it, you're good to go. I use a lot of insecticidal soaps. I try to stay as organic as possible. Sometimes it's not always practical to do that, depending on what you have, depending on how much you actually have. But I really try to stay as organic as I possibly can because it's so much better for, well, for the environment, number one, but, you know, for the yard as far as, you know the birds and the i always worry about the lizards and everything else because we have so much of that type of stuff here so i want to try to stay as environmentally friendly as i possibly can so anyway um i i actually that i'll probably be putting an insecticidal soap on too um the insecticidal soaps are beautiful too because they put like a really pretty shine on the leaves and i like that and that has got a really pretty like the leaf on it if you if you can look hone in here and leave they're shiny and it just makes them even a little bit more shiny when you put that insecticidal soap so it's kind of a twofold thing not only is it protecting the plant from the bugs but it makes the plant look really pretty so and not to mention they're just so spectacular in the fact that they just um you can put a lot of really pretty deep things in the garden and then you to put that that green and yellow pop in there is just absolutely beautiful so those are an arbor cola and again i believe those are a zone 10 um yeah, 10 and warmer, I believe is what that is. So let's go ahead and um, let's go over to here. This, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is a flax lily. Now these, when I put these guys in the landscape, I had probably, oh gosh, I put them all the way around the outsides of the border. And they were absolutely beautiful. I didn't really know much about them. I did a you know, little bit of reading on the tag and stuff like that. And I kind of uh, Googled a little bit. I usually go to, um, what is it called? The South Florida Plant Guide. I use that website all the time for everything that I, almost everything that I do here with growing. They, that website just gives you so much information in regards to everything absolutely everything and it's designed for um, people who live here in South Florida which is absolutely wonderful the other um, website I go to a lot is the University of Florida I believe it's the IFA IFAC <laughs> Anyways, the unit, it's an extension of the University of Florida. It's their agri agricultural um, and sciences division, I believe it is, but that's another really good website to go to. But anyway, back to the flax lily. These guys are really, really pretty. And the first two years, they were magnificent. Didn't have any bug problems. They don't really require a lot, a lot of water. They were getting a lot of water, or they were getting water from just like the landscape. Um, this, this particular flower bed, it gets just the landscape. There's no irrigation actually in here. And we didn't do that primarily because the way the yard is set up, all of the, um, the 
uh, irrigation that's around shoots right into this particular flower bed. So therefore, um, I didn't want it to get too much by putting drip irrigation in there as well. But anyway, the flax lily, they really don't like a lot, a lot of water. So I had to be really, really careful. And I had to, to actually take some of the sprinkler heads and kind of, you know, make some, so they didn't make it or, or angle them so they didn't hit directly into the flower bed all the time. Because I noticed where I was getting just a little bit of, of um, rot. When I say that, some of the outer pieces or whatever, which they probably needed to be pulled up anyway because they were getting too close to the border. But I pulled those up and I'm adjusting, just make a few little minor adjustments with the sprinklers made all the difference in the world. But again, those are flax lilies. And let me just flip the, count, the uh, camera around again. These guys right here, they put on like, um, uh, you probably can't see, they're like a little bit of a, it's a bluish lavender colored flower. Um, I got to tell you, I'm not really overly fond with those. They're just, um, they're kind of they're kind of messy and I, while I'm not really a, I'm not a formal gardener at all I'm, I'm very very loosey-goosey when it comes to my gardening style um, the tropicals I like very lush um, you know deep um, I like full but I don't like when it's messy and these these tend to get a little bit messy so usually what I'll do is every I don't know maybe twice a year I'll come in and I'll just go down inside. It takes a little bit of time, but I'll go down inside and I'll just kind of nip those off. And then I'm left with the beautiful, you know, lacy, um, strappy, I call them. They're very strappy. Um, and I love it too because of the, the leaf structure, how it's really deep green. It's veined on the sides, you know, with the yellowy uh, color. So they, it, it, it also makes a really pretty pop in the garden next to the Arbor Cola. But anyway, so that is a flax lily. And then moving around, Let's move here around here. We have another flax lily. And let me just stop here real quick. Oh, see, look here. We got a broken branch. So I don't really know how that happened, but it did. So we'll just, this is on the thyrella. So we'll just chalk that up to, we don't really know what happened there. And we'll just take that and put that in the composter. See, that's what I'm saying. These guys are very, very easy to break. We really haven't had any wind. So I'm thinking maybe, I might have done it with a hose, which is very, very probable that that is what happened. So anyway, it's no big deal. It, I'll just break that piece off and they regenerate very, very quickly. But back to what I was going to start talking to you about here are these guys. Now this is a flax lily that's in here, but off to the side, this guy right in here, and he's also growing right into my flax lily. You can kind of see, see if I can separate this guy, but you can see this guy right here. This is a heliconia or a parrot flower. They are really, really beautiful. I absolutely love them. But I will say, a couple of years ago, when I bought them, I, I just fell in love with them. I went to a nursery and I saw them and I was like, oh my gosh, these look like birds of paradise, but better. I don't really, I'm not a bird of paradise fan, but these guys are the leaves are a little softer than the bird of paradise and the flower which looks like a bird's beak they are a little bit more um they're they're i don't know they're just they're just to me I, I i preferred the way the um the parrot flower looked it was just a little bit more petite the green was or the the, the leaf was a little greener a little softer um maybe that's just what it is it's just a softer looking version of the bird of paradise but they are very heat. They love the heat. They do not tolerate cold at all. As a matter of fact, even here, um, I had to really make sure that um, if I had them in containers that I, you know, did put them up in the quarters, protected them from the wind and any kind of little little cool that we did because they do not anything like I'm going to say probably below 50. They uh -uh, they're not happy at all anymore. But I will say they are aggressive. They are so, so aggressive. I did not know that they grow from tubers or corms. I think it's a tuber, if I'm not mistaken. They grow, they're just like, it's just like a little tuber. I wish, matter of fact, let me see if I can pull one of these guys up for you here. See if I can do this real quick. I'm gonna see if I can, oh darn, it snapped off. That's okay because I need to get rid of these guys anyway, but I really wanted to be able to show you all what these guys look like. See if I can grab one really, really careful. These are not pulling up for me at all the way I want to. Isn't that the way it works when, when you want to show something you can't? <laughs> Let me see if I can't get one of these guys up because I really want to show you what they look like and just how invasive they actually are. Okay, let me see. 
Nope, I thought I had him. I thought I had him. Okay, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep doing this until we get it. In the meantime, you guys can garden with me here. And I'm <laughs> these all need to be pulled out anyway. Okay, we're just gonna keep pulling, keep going. Oh, maybe I can get one here. He's a big guy. Let's see? Nope. Nope. Okay. Well, let's see. This guy's probably a little bit better. You can kind of see the. Matter of fact, let me do this. You can kind of see the the main. I mean, let me see if I can explain to you. This, all these little roots that are on here, imagine that being like, you know, 20 more of those. And it, it follows like a tuber that goes, matter of fact, this piece right here, it goes really, really long. And what it does is it just continues to go grow underneath the ground and it just pops up and it, it just continues to just come up. It, it shoots, it'll shoot one of these guys up and then over and it'll shoot up another one and another one. Well, I found myself, I, I put them in and they were so pretty and they were blooming beautifully. And then all of a sudden I started noticing them coming up underneath my curbing and out into the grass. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I can't control these things. And so needless to say, I've, you know, I, I pull them out all the time. I thought I had most of these out when I was doing a good clean out a couple months ago. Wrong, I didn't. They're coming up as babies all over the place in the front planter and i'll take you over there in a little bit i think i pretty much got them out of there but i'm not sure it seems like i'll go over there and check a little bit later on you know like a couple of weeks later and i'll have baby a couple of babies but anyway my point is behind all this jibber jabber is the fact that these parrot flowers while they are very very beautiful and i will always continue to grow them i will make sure that i do not grow them in my landscape if you have a lot of property and you have an area that's just like a, just a just a I don't know just a massive just whatever and you don't really care you know if, if you don't care about a, the invasiveness I would say go ahead and put them in because if, if you can just let them grow wild they will naturalize they will definitely naturalize in that area and they will be spectacular for you but most often I have seen people lately including myself grow them in pots and they look so much they, they I should say they look better they look beautiful when they're in the landscape, but you can control them so, so much easier when they are in, um, in containers. And then not to mention when they're in containers, because they are so, um, they, they do not like the cold even a little bit, you can take them and put them in, um, you know, overwinter them. And, and what I mean by that for me here in South Florida is I can bring them up on the porch um, and, or, you know, even in, in our den or whatever and, and have them in a little bit of a warmer, um, a warmer area as the winter months go on. So anyway, helicopter parrot flowers what I call them absolutely beautiful but if you do not want something that's aggressive you do not want to be pulling up little pups all the time I highly re recommend that you grow them in containers and again I believe they are I believe they're a zone 10 and warmer if I'm not mistaken so anyway let's go ahead and continue moving around now over here I have caladiums now I was a little disappointed while they're absolutely beautiful and they just popped up all over the place because I started these guys from bulbs. Um, I, I absolutely love them. I thought what I was buying were red ones. Well, it turned out that I have one red one and it's right there. And I was just so very disappointed because I bought a mixed bag. I bought a couple of mixed bags and on the, on the bag, it showed all, it showed a couple of mixes, but most of them were like all red. And I thought, okay, well, this would be great because I love that pop of red and yellow and orange in my tropical landscapes. I try to do it every year or year round, I should say is when I can. But in this particular case, I, I ended up with a lot of pink. <laughs> <laughs> and while pinks are really pretty, it's just not something that I generally do in the landscape. So I was a little disappointed with the fact that they weren't the color that I really, that I really chose. But live and learn. What I'll do next time is I will just, um, I don't know what I'll do next time. I don't know if I just won't buy the mix, like, because it was just a bag of just, um, of a bunch of tubes or what do you call them not tubers see I'm, see I'm still on the parrot flower but it, when you buy the bulbs when you buy the bulbs or whatever it's I've always purchased them from like um, Home Depot or whatever and usually what they said was in the bag was in the bag but I believe I got these from like Sam's Club or something like that and I got them for really inexpensive I got a lot a lot a lot of them but what was it what it said it was on the tag really wasn't what it was in the bag so I was a little disappointed so anyway again live and learn so so anyway, flipping back around, same same planter actually, um, another arboricola that we've got here, and then another one of my um, 
uh, I want to say oyster plants, but that's not right. Copper plants is back in here. And let's just take a little examination. I don't see really anything damage wise. Eh, there's a couple of little tiny holes here that may be from slugs, but I did treat them. Um, but anyway, we've got him and again, the another arborocola. And then over here, um, this guy, let's see if I can get in here. This guy right here is Chrysandra. And I put them in here in hopes that they would be able to get enough sun. I've got a couple of them actually over here. Chrysandra's, uh, Chrysandra's another warm, loving um, perennial. These will just continue to come back year after year after year. I don't generally have to cut them down uh, too awful much. Um, usually, I, I, I usually, this is actually the first time I've actually grown them in the landscape. I usually grow them in containers and I'll just usually just, you know, trim them down um, as we go into like cooler months. I'll trim them down and depending on, you know, if, if we have a mild winter, which most time we do, um, I can just trim them down and they'll just, you know, in December and January, they're just, you know, blooming beautifully. But um, anyway, I put these in the landscape this year and I put them in an area again this my front yard was completely we, we redesigned this whole front yard and it, it literally had no shade it, there was no trees here at all and when we put all these trees here they were while they were larger they were still on the small side when it came to um the amount of sun that we got and because there's the queen palms um they're just such prolific they they say they're pretty moderate growers they really are i mean these things have really really taken off but in by that by that same token they've created just a lot of shade and while i love that dappling of shade in the front yard much needed it's so much easier to grow things in a dappled light for me than it is that full sun because our home sits to the west and when that sun is setting it is just blazing blazing hot and it will take the the plant that says grow in full sun and it will crispy critter it in a in just a heartbeat so <laughs> i i take that with a grain of salt when i go to the nurseries if i go to a private nursery i can pretty much pretty much i know that they know that you can't grow things you know in full sun that maybe at home depot or at lowe's or whatever their tag some of those growers um they don't really gear in as i don't think it's specifically sometimes because they do a wider area if i'm not mistaken so um i and i could be just not thinking that through correctly but i can go to a, a private nursery um, here in wh where I live and I can buy the same plant at Home Depot and it will read, you know, part sun and full sun. So again, I think just being an experienced gardener, someone who kind of knows, you know, and, and again, you have to be able to know for your area as well. That's, that's probably one of the biggest things is knowing your area, knowing, um, your, um, you know, your, you know, your soil, you know, the, the way your house is situated, if you're getting an east facing sun, if you're getting a west facing sun. My sister, for example, she lives right here in town with me, or she lives in Bradenton, okay, but she lives out in Mayaka City. Now, that is, um, I'm a zone 10, well, she's like a nine out there. That's how much difference, and I, I can, she's about 30 minutes away from me, 25, 30 minutes away from me but I'm close to the Gulf, so she will get a freeze out there, whereas the freeze won't touch us here. So just again, you know, we, she could shop at the same nursery that I shop at, you know, and we're both reading those tags, but we could be both, you know, completely, um, you know, she could be growing it absolutely wonderfully while I may kill it or vice versa. So my point behind that is you just have to know your area you need to know you know what does best in um in you know in your general area what you know the growth habits are um for you know the the where you have it located in the sun in the shade blah 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 so anyway these are chrysandras and they're absolutely beautiful and they're not blooming as well as i'd like for them to and again i think it's because they're just not getting the sun that they need to get so anyway i what i'll probably end up doing is i'll probably end up taking those out and i'll just put them in a pot and that'll be the truth that'll be the tell-all for me will be if, if they start blooming within a week or two after i put them in the pot it just meant that out here they're just not going to bloom because they're getting too much shade they're absolutely gorgeous in color the the leaf structure is absolutely beautiful you can see the really the ripply leaf on them and they're just pretty deep green and everything but these beautiful beautiful bright orange flowers is what i what i was hoping to be able to to get all over the plant and as a general rule that's usually what ends up happening when they do get the proper sun so 
Anyway, one more thing um, in this planter is going to be my crotons. These are probably my all-time favorite, and these are duplicated throughout my landscape, um, both in the front and the backyard. I love crotons. One of the things with the crotons that I, that I don't know if everybody experiences this, but again, I, like I told you, <laughs> like I said earlier, bugs just love my yard for whatever reason it is. I fight crotons or, or disease or, or, or pests, disease as well, but pests and disease with crotons alarmingly. I, I don't know if, you know, it's just where my house is located, I'm not real sure, or if in general crotons just tend to get um, a lot of these issues, but I fight scale, I fight aphids, which bring on sooty mold. Last, actually this past winter, the flower bed that sits directly behind me over here, I had to cut all of my crotons back down to the bare bones and it made me sick. They were so beautiful. And they, while I normally give them a little trim, you know, every couple of months or so, um, I didn't get in front of it. And it was a couple of months where I just didn't do a whole lot in the yard. My husband had some back surgery or whatever, which he's recovering very well. Um, but it took my attention away from doing the things that I would normally do um, to make sure that I was there for him. So I, I, I got real behind it. And so by the time I came out here in the front yard, I had just, the, my crotons had developed so such an awful infestation of the um, scale. It was the soft-shelled scale, and they just secrete that. Well, they 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 suck on the. Um, if you cut open a, a croton, like the leaf or whatever, they're real sappy, and so um, or juicy, whatever you want to classify that as. Anyway, scales will attach themselves, and they will literally suck the juice out of any plant that has juice in it to be sucked. And then they excrete um, just, you know, a horrible, um, you know, a horrible black mold, soot, whatever it is. It's gross. It not only attacked the leaves, but it went right down onto the actual stem, the, the trunk or the, not the trunk, but the stem. And um, so needless to say, I cut it. I just cut them all back down to the bare bones. This was one of them, actually. I cut this guy right here down to the bare bones and he's got all pretty um, new growth on him. But I did notice that right here look at this see here i've got a little bit of i think some of it might be old and that's good because it's flaking off but i think i saw the other day that there was some new i want to say there was something there's some new on there but again you have to keep in front of that because in the warm climate here uh, you get just a little bit and in one on a, on a Monday, you'll get a little bit by Wednesday, it's infested. So you gotta stay on top of that. But I absolutely love crotons. They are worth the effort for me because they put on such a show. I do not know the actual name. I have so many different varieties of crotons in my yard that I and really what I need to do is I need to start getting better about taking the tag and putting a tag like down inside. So that way when I am doing these videos and I'm talking about them, I can tell you guys what kind of crotons they actually are. Um, and like I said, I think, you know what? I would be telling you wrong if I said, because I don't know. We've got, a, I've got, I have so many different varieties. I know I have some Mamie's. I think I have some painter's brush. I think there's a couple called that. Um, and then there are other different varieties, but um, love the crotons. Again, very warm weathered um, shrub. They, uh, they, they just, when you trim them here, they, they don't die back as a general rule here unless we would get like a freeze, which is very uncommon for us. If we do get any kind of, um, you know, cooler temperatures, I will get a little bit of leaf loss, but they are very quick to recover. Um, I believe they are actually, if I'm not mistaken, I think a croton is actually deemed a zone 10 and warmer. You can grow them in a, in a nine in the landscape if you cover them and, but you would um, run the risk of losing them a little bit quicker in areas like for example my sister she would probably end up losing hers and as long as it wasn't a sustained cold freeze or whatever you can trim them and they would come back very nicely so those are all of the shrubs and perennials that are actually in this bed that are right here all of this that is what i've showed you that it go all the way around then my staple plants that i actually have in here are the pygmy date which is back here He's absolutely beautiful. I love him. He's a three-trunked pygmy date, and um, he's quite happy. He's getting fertilized well. 
and he's absolutely loving life. Let me just come around here. He's got a very beautiful um, stature. I love the way he was shaped when we got him. He had a trunk that just kind of, the third trunk, well, or whichever one you would have class it the first trunk, but they're with the three. He just, this particular one just took a, an angle that just looks so, so very pretty. And of course, my caladiums are kind of in the way there but if you can see he just kind of grows in a very really pretty um arch there and it, not arch but a um almost leaning actually uh, like a lean but he's very very pretty and let me back up a little bit and kind of show you he's very very pretty and very very happy so that's a good thing i don't have any scales in him that i know of no skeletonizers i think i think we're all pretty good then we have the queen palms and let me see if i can give you guys a good look of the queen palms these are my beauties. These are a very, the staple actually in this plant bed or this flower bed out in front. I've got three of them and they are absolutely gorgeous. They are loving their life. And it is extremely important that I keep them very, very happy because they are big and I do not want to have them removed because it would destroy so much if I had to have um, a big truck come in here and literally cut it down. So I do my very utmost best to try to keep them happy with, um, you know, pest and disease and proper fertilization. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be releasing another video that talks strictly about um, palm trees in the landscape and the proper watering, fertilization, soil, uh, yada, 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 on and on. So uh, be looking forward to, or be looking, yeah, looking forward to that video. Um, I'll be releasing that hopefully soon. But in the meantime, back to this video, my my queen palms are absolutely beautiful and I love them. And so that is this particular um, flower bed. Then moving over here, I'm gonna, of course, I'm gonna step on these guys. But over here in this flower bed, I just recently planted up variegated hibiscus. And I put them, I underplant them under this beautiful spindle palm that I have, which is another um, palm tree, um, species of palm tree that I have. This is also, let's see, not also, this is actually a three trunked. Um, the, the queen palms were single, just one single that went up. This is three. And my spindle palm, um, when I bought this guy, I mean, you can see how large these two actually are. When you come around here, you can see this guy's a little bit more puny. When I bought this, this, um, when I bought this guy, he was on the back lot at one of the private nurseries that we have um, locally here. And um, he had a pretty high price tag on him, but he didn't look real, real good. He didn't look diseased or anything like that. He just looked a little um, gangly, I guess. I don't know the, know the word to look. He just, he wasn't really, really, um, he needed to be cared for. He needed to come out of this pot. So I made a little deal with um, the nursery uh, guy and he sold it to me for half the price. I brought it home. I made sure that I amend the soil really, really well because we have very, very sandy soil here in South Florida and, and the nutrients just whew, flow right through. So I made a, a special point to make sure that he got proper fertilization, um, made sure that I did not underplant anything um, because I did not want um, the plants that I put around him eventually. I did not want there to be any competition between um, the plants that would be put around him and him. So, and I think that I, 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 I'm very happy that I did that. It's been two years since this guy's been in. The little guy here has had an opportunity to strengthen and get a little bit bigger. He's putting on such new uh, growth. The fronds, matter of fact, he's got a baby that's coming out right here. He's just as sexy as he can be. And then, um, so I, I'm very happy that I waited as long as I did. But what I did was I, I, I kept thinking, what am I gonna put in there? What am I gonna put in there? What am I gonna put in there? So I went and I found these beautiful hibiscus. They're variegated hibiscus and I did not buy them specifically for this, although look at that show, that is absolutely gorgeous. They're like a, I don't know, they're like a peachy, creamy, I, I'm terrible when it comes to color sometimes. I think I have color blindness sometimes too, but he's like, um, he's like a pinky or a peachy, a peachy red. That's kind of the way I look at it. Just like a peachy red. He's just as pretty as he can be. It's not like a red red. He's like an orangey red or a peachy red. I don't know. He's just really, really pretty. But the foliage is what, what just turned me on. I was just like, look at this foliage. I mean, it's just, it's gorgeous with its, it's got, you know, like uh, mauve like a mauve color, pink, green, creamy yellows. It's just absolutely spectacular. And as long as you keep them in um, a good sun, 
they should continue to put on that show of that variegated show. If they get too much shade, my understanding is that they'll just turn really all solid green. And that would make me very sad because then it would just be the blooms, which that would be okay. But between the blooms and between the variegated colors that are in there, it's putting on quite a show. I'm gonna back up here just a little bit and let you guys take a look and see just how pretty that actually looks. And then you can see just how big my guy is getting. My spindle palm, he's absolutely beautiful. But that is this little circle um, planter that I that we that I just planted up, as a matter of fact, about a couple of weeks ago. So he's doing very, very, very wonderful. So moving on, this is the front, the very front planter. And this guy, we have yet another palm. He is my foxtail, and he is another one of my babies. He is also a three trunk. He's got two small and then a third one that's a little bit smaller, and they do compete for nutrients. I've read that, um, I've been told that, and I believe in my experience with these guys, I, I see that. So what I make sure that I do is I make sure that I give these guys really, really, really good fertilization. And again, um, I will be talking about palm trees in another video and I will show you guys exactly what I use and why I use it because it's extremely important to make sure not not that just really all of your plants get really good proper fertilization because it's the key to success in gardening but with palm trees they require very very special attention when it comes to fertilizer and again I'll be covering that in another video very shortly here um, but anyway back to this guy He's very, very pretty, and I, he's very happy, and I just make sure that I keep him very well fertilized so that way he can compete. This little guy right here can compete with his brothers because <laughs> these guys are big and thick and beautiful. And by the way, it's, they're beautiful when you line them, when you wrap them with um, some um, like Christmas lights. We did that over the past years um, at Christmas time. We wrapped them with lights, put on a beautiful show. So we don't get snow here, so we have to, to, to make, make our own festivities out of palm, with palm trees. But anyway, this planter also has um, the crotons. Here's another um, type of crobot. I believe this is, I don't know if this is a Mamie. I, I don't, I'm honestly, again, I'm not real sure. This is the one I think that's the painter's brush, and you can see why. It looks like someone took and splattered paint, took a, took a paintbrush, and just took it and just went like this with the with the paintbrush. That's kind of what, to me, that's what it reminds me of. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that is what this actually is, is the painter's brush. And he was so pretty. I went ahead and I got three of them. I got one here, and then I have another one here, and then I've got this one over here. And then, of course, we have this particular croton, which he is the same color as the one that is over in the other flower bed. But with this particular one, or with these particular ones, these are the ones that I had to cut that back down to the bare bones. And I'm gonna bring you in closer. Can you see kind of the dark? It's gotten a lot better, but you can see kind of, I, I'm hoping you guys can see this, but you see the dark trunk that's on there? That is what just completely coated all the leaves. It coated the, the, the brand, or the, yeah, the, the, the stem, the stalk here, it coated all that, and it just looked horrible. I mean, I, I just, I had no words. I was just sick. I'm like, that's probably the first time that it had something take over so bad. Just, it was just so horrible. So when I came out here and I had to cut these guys back, I, I almost cried. I was just like sick, but I was like, okay, I'm quite sure they'll come back. They, you know, when I was cutting them, you know, all the, um, the ends were nice and fresh and clean. And then I just took, you know, a little rag and I just kind of washed a little bit with some, some insecticidal soap and I had them sprayed and everything. And they did, they came back absolutely glorious and, you know, no, no, no worse than, you know, no worse off. And so I, I'm really glad for that. So anyway, the crotons are looking really good. Then in this particular planner, again, um, the only other different thing that I have are the, um, I'm drawing a blank, isn't that terrible? These guys are Maui Exora. So when I did put them in, I put um, I put a very select few in here, but I'm kind of wondering, or thinking maybe he's gonna just, he's gonna be able to take up just, you know, this whole area right here. Again, him, he'll be able to do the same thing. And I've got them all growing over in here to where they'll do the same thing. They'll get just big enough that they'll fill in, you know, some of these voids or whatever, which is why I didn't put really anything else in here because I didn't want there to be just a cluttering of plants that I had to end up digging out later. Probably I could have put one maybe in here 
it, it still kept that rock. I probably could have put one in there and I still could actually do that. I still could actually probably put one right in there. But again, being a, a gardener and it, it, that's, that's what we do. That is what we do. That is the beauty of gardening. You're constantly taking things out, putting things in, spraying for bugs. Sometimes I get so frustrated. I'm like, I'm never gonna garden again. And I'm thinking, no way. <laughs> then I get back to reality. Um, I, I absolutely love it. I love, um, it's, it's very therapeutic for me to come out here and to put things in and watch them grow. And I get a little disappointed when I'm losing things. But um, anyway, it, it's, it's something that I absolutely love to do. So let me turn you around here and show you um, let's just start over here. I have another, I have another spindle palm that's over in this area. He's a big guy too. He's three, but his trunks are pretty good size, and he goes really, really high. By my purpose behind putting this guy where he's close proximity to my queen palms, but he will always maintain a canopy that stays directly underneath of the queen palm, while the spindle palm will get quite tall. He'll get to be about 15 to 18 foot tall. My queen, queen palms will tower 25 and 30 foot. So he will always, you know, be um, a little bit shorter um, underneath the queen palms. So that, um, I wasn't concerned about that. But anyway, flipping around, we have another pygmy date that's over here. And then I have some Indian hawthorn. These guys in here look a little bit sparse to me, but they developed, um, they got a, a chili thrip, uh, got a hold of them. And it just, they just kind of, I don't know, they stunted the growth. They just didn't do, they, you know, they, you can see on the leaf here, this is really what chili thrip actually does. Let me show you here. That's what chili thrip actually does. It just ruins the leaf. And I think it was responsible for making these all dwarfy. So what I'll do is Indian hawthorn is, a, it's a funny, funny thing, a funny shrub. It will actually, it, it looks like it's dead sometimes when you cut it back, it gets like really woody and you'll cut it back and it'll just, it'll just like, boom out with just growth and you're like oh my gosh I thought the thing was dead no Indian Hawthorn I, I've been growing it for a number of years now and I've just I, I keep learning with it it's really I, I love it it's kind of like people in the northern countries that grow boxwoods and stuff like that it just it grows goes through the winter months there's like I mean it really it actually it puts on a little bit of a bloom I believe twice a year I believe it does it in the fall and then it does it in the spring early spring but just before winter, we'll get some some um, blooms on this guy. But it's it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I just keep it hedged down, you know, very you know very low, and all the way across. Matter of fact, it, it's in some need right now. And then in the back, of course, you know, my lovely little crotons that I've got back here, and then um, my arboricola, more crotons and arboricola, which is just you know filled in this front bed here. And then I have a podocarpus. He's in need of some trimming. I've got to do some maintenance out here. So, and now this, actually I forgot you guys, I have a chevalier. Remember when I was talking to you guys about the chevalier over in this, this planter bed over here? Um, those are the arboricola. This is the chevalier. I actually have two out of them under my cabana in the backyard. And then I have two that are out here, but see the difference? Now these, these are also, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they're called umbrella plants, but the tech, I believe the term is chevalier. And they, um, they're quite spectacular. I have another one over in the corner over there by the front door um, in containers. And they're absolutely beautiful. Now with the Chevalera, they will actually get to be, um, they get quite, quite large when you put them in the landscape. And they will develop into a tree as the, if they lose, if you let them lose their bottom leaves, they will actually turn, develop into a tree. Hence, I think that's where the name, the term comes umbrella plant. But um, these guys, I'm just gonna keep them in their pots for now. And usually what I do is I just go through and I top, see if I can cut through here. You can see this guy's got quite a bend, but you can see here, See this piece of growth that's right here and look at all this growth that's coming up in here. I can usually come in here just up underneath one of these new growths right here and take that whole top off and then it'll continue, it'll just continue to grow. But you can, that way you can keep it, um, the growth habit or not the growth habit, you can keep it topped and that way you can keep it, um, you know, uh, shorter if you want to put it in on the patio like me. You know, it's getting up there as you can see, it's, you know, getting quite high. So I may eventually go ahead and have to top him as well. And my, the same thing with the ones in my front. So, um, but anyway, the front planter again here, I have, again, there, there, we left off with the pot of carpus. I have Indian hawthorn and arboricola all along in here. Then I have, I actually, this guy's in a pot down here. I need to, to plant him. Where's he at? There he is. He's my, I call them red sisters. These are tea plants. 
Um, I believe a lot of people refer to them as Thai. I looked it up and I believe the, the, the proper pronunciation is tea plant. And they are absolutely beautiful, but they are finicky. You have to be careful when you're watering them. If you have any kind of fluoride in your water, it will actually burn the tips um, make it like brown looking or whatever. That's something that I just recently learned. I don't have fluoride in, in our particular well water, so I'm, I'm okay, we, we had it tested, so I'm good there. But um, these guys are, are really, really pretty. These are a zone 10 and warmer. They do not like the cold at all. As a matter of fact, they freak out if anything goes below 50. They start dropping their leaves and turning yellow. Now here is this beautiful parrot flower that I was talking about that is very invasive. He's in a little pot. I'm gonna take him out of there and I'm gonna actually put him in a bigger pot. But look at this, isn't this beautiful? I mean, he is just as happy. It's that orange and red color and he's just as pretty as he can be as long as you keep them in a container and you keep them contained because when you put them in the landscape they lose themselves in the landscape and they just grow all over the place and again if you have an area where you can let them naturalize it would probably be a, a spectacular show but for now we're going to keep them in the pot and then this is the front planter bed i've got um, a planter full of um, more crotons and i have um these are caladiums, but these take a little bit of a partial sun. So I needed to, I had these full of, uh, I believe it's Waller, Wallerania impatience. They're the old, I call them old timey impatience. They were patients that I grew, you know, 20, 30 years ago well before the sun patients came came up you know or the new they, i don't know new guinean patients sun patients anyway i had never heard of those before until the um the old timey patients started developing like um i believe it was like a powdery mildew and they were having trouble with it so they kind of pulled it for a little while and they came out with the sun patients but anyway i got off the beaten path there a little bit these guys right here are the caladiums and i replaced these with the um or I, I replaced my impatience with these guys and they're doing quite beautiful they look real nice and happy in the pot so hopefully they'll go through the rest of the summer the caladiums will actually continue to grow for me right through um you know november december they're really funny until they get you know a like you know below 45 they um they'll continue to stay that way but again you know moving on we've got more crotons more tea plants flax lily in the back and if you can see look at this aggressive little bad boy back here see he's just kind of he just kind of came right up in between the flax lily there and i got to get in there and i got to pull him out but what are you going to do so anyway moving on we got more of the crotons and then i've got another matter this guy needs to be watered just a little bit he's kind of drooping just a little bit but i've got um more um, of the caladiums and the crotons that are in this particular flower bed and then all down this side i've got um, uh, just a big row of our, our big hedge of indian hawthorn you can see just how quite beautiful they actually are they um this is what i'm saying that the indian hawthorn just they put on quite a show as far as you know just dense growth um that you know, they stay very nice and petite you know you just kind of trim them off and um, they're, they're just they're just beautiful they really really are and I they make such a nice hedge and as long as you keep them sprayed because they do um, I, I have issues with the with the thrip and so as long as we keep them sprayed we're pretty good and then last but not least in this flower bed I got a little dead one here but that's okay because he's coming off he'll, he'll eventually die off but um, these guys are my spindles as well and I've got two of them actually growing in this particular flower bed um, yeah yeah we got two of them one two and then i didn't show you um further back here um this in this flower bed that we you and i just walked down we've got a, a three more actually we've got a triple in the center a triple spindle you can see just how big he's probably all of um 15 foot now i'm thinking i'm going to say 15 foot they both they all three are but i've got you know the one that that anchors the, the, yeah, the singles i'm running out of running out of steam here We've got this one who is a single, and then we've got the triple, and then we've got another single. And you can see he's getting ready to come off. And then underneath, he's got all this beautiful green. So he'll be coming off pretty soon, which will be good. So there you have it. In a nutshell, that is my front yard. This is a little bit about, um, again, I just wanted to kind of show you, you know, what the things that I grow in my garden, the things that I have success with. Um, the, the problems that I have and then um, 
the I, I will actually make more videos to show you um, our backyard uh, most of the things that are in um, that are in this video and in, in the front yard I have duplicated in the backyard um, and there are a couple maybe some different things that are actually back there that um, I look forward to showing you guys so I am developing a sweat mustache <laughs> out here doing this video that's how humid and hot it is out here and like I said it's probably about eight o'clock and I bet you that humidity is just getting a little bit more um, as the evening goes on because there is a lot of rain in the forecast and I mean I can almost smell it in the air so I think by tomorrow by the, the wee hours of the morning I think we're supposed to be getting um, it's supposed to be over top of us so anyway I really um, I know I rambled on a lot but um, I, I just so enjoy gardening and I really enjoyed making this video and I really hope that you guys enjoyed it as well and if you did please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and I believe there's also a little bell that you can also just uh, tick and when you do that it will um, it will um, send you notifications as to when I release new videos which I'm planning on doing and uh, you'll be the first to know so again um, thank you guys so much for watching and I just I love doing this and I gotta go wipe this sweat mustache off but until the next video bye for now guys